Chapter 31 On that Sunday, as Dan always did with his two boys, Daniel and Stefano, the three of them decided to go dirt bike riding on the Big Cypress Circuit, a gorgeous track next to the Everglades. As they did every Sunday morning, Dan loaded each of his boys' bikes and his own on the trailer. On their way to the track, they stopped at the nearest supermarket to load up with drinks, food and plenty of ice. They left early in the morning to take advantage of the full day. Rain or shine, they were always ready to make the best out of the day. At the track, there were other people with different sized bikes, so the promoter of the track gave each group of bikes a time slot to go on the track according to the bike's sizes. Dan and the boys had been going there for a few years. They pretty much already knew everyone there. On this specific day, there was a competition, but only for expert riders. All the expert riders had 450cc bikes, four strokes. Dan's bike was a 125cc two stroke. But because of his expertise in racing, he was invited to participate in the race. The track was a very short one with high jumps, a much better track for smaller engine bikes than for larger engine ones. That was, in fact, the main reason for which Dan chose to take up the challenge and everyone knew it. It was not about speed, but quickness. The winning was not a trophy, but money each one of the drivers had put down, and the winner would take it all. There were at least 20 bikes and over $800 in prize money to the winner of the race. Dan was very excited, yet very nervous, given that it had been a long time since he last raced. No matter how many times one had been racing, feeling nervous before a race goes with the thrill to win. He checked his bike from rear to front, tyre pressure, oil level, water level, spark plugs, gas, brakes, gear, etc. Then all of the bikes were called in to line up behind the white line. Both Stefano and Daniel hugged their dad and wished him good luck. They knew their father was going to do well, but since all the bikes were faster than his, they were a bit sceptical about their dad finishing in first place. The second the checker flag went up, all of the bikes increased their RPMs, with one hand on the clutch and the right foot on the pedal gear. As soon as the checker flag was dropped, everyone let go of the clutch, and all the bikes took off like bats out of hell. Dan didn't do as well at the beginning of the race since he only had a 125cc, not enough to keep up with the 450cc. But as soon as the first turn came, having a smaller bike gave him an amazing advantage, so it was not long before he started passing all the bikes that were ahead of him. The race was eight laps of the entire track. On the first lap, Dan was in seventh place, still a way to go to first place, but the quickness of his bike made it so much easier to pass each one of the bikes in front of him. He could see from time to time his two boys watching the race. They looked excited to see their father get closer and closer to first place. On the sixth lap, Dan finally passed the first place rider, now he was in first all alone with no one in front. He soon started to go faster around the curves and going very high on each one of the jumps. At one point he was about eight bike lengths from the closest bike to him and pretty much had the race won. But on the last lap, right before the last turn, his rear tyre blew. It lost all air in less than a second. As he came out of the last turn, Dan was now riding on just the rim and no air in the tyre. As soon as he came out of that turn with his front wheel up, the rear tyre hit a rock which propelled the bike and its rider through the air and caused Dan to lose control. He flipped three times from head to feet until he landed on his head, the bike landing hard on his right leg. He passed out almost immediately. The race was stopped and everyone, including Stefano and Daniel, came rushing to where their dad was lying on the ground, unresponsive. The bike was moved off his leg and the paramedics turned him over and decided not to remove his helmet in case he had damaged a vertebra or had a skull fracture. The ambulance had been called, but since they were in the middle of nowhere, it was going to be a while before they showed up. A few minutes later went by and Dan began to regain consciousness and even sat up on his own. He looked around him as if he didn't know where he was or what he had been doing. Dad, are you okay? Stefano asked, kneeling beside him. Come on, Dad, say something, can you talk? Daniel insisted. Are we back? Dan asked. Why am I here? We're at the bike track, Dad, don't you remember? Stefano looked into his father's eyes and saw an odd glimmer pass in front of his pupils. And you're here too? Yes, Dad, I'm here too, Daniel replied, shooting a questioning glance at his brother. What year is it? Don't you remember? It's 2014. This is Sunday, Stefano said, a little curious about his dad's odd questions. The ambulance is going to take time to get here. I think I'd better take you to the hospital in my car, OK? Dan was in no condition to object and only wanted to know why. Why was he lying on the racetrack after all that happened? I shouldn't be here, I should be back in Key West, or was this all a dream? During the drive to the hospital, Dan wondered if he had been lying unconscious on the track for such a long time that he had dreamed the whole thing. He remembered clearly giving his amulet to Daniel for him to get back to Pahokee, while accepting his fate and even wanting to atone for his transgressions and abide by God's will. I shouldn't be here in my son's car. But when he touched his chest, he realised that he was wearing his dreamcatcher, 
and that maybe it had not been a dream after all. Yet what was real I shouldn't be here, he told himself for the upteen times. An eerie feeling then invaded his mind and body. He felt as if he was no longer in Stefano's car. Out of a twirling fog he saw something he didn't expect to see. Is that what I think it is? Is that even possible? Bordering the Keechabee Lake, the tiny town community of Pahoki, featured many seemingly abandoned houses, a small marina, a very old hotel called Chippewa Inn, with rusted signs with a dirt and gravel driveway, some locals drinking beer in the middle of the afternoon, children riding their bicycles, and a black cat with a white patch atop its head, lying by the dirty window that seemed as if no one had cleaned it in decades. Outside, there was a sign in neon lights that read, Vacancy. Shaking himself out of the dreamlike trance and out of the captivating scene, Dan woke up as they arrived in front of the hospital's emergency entrance. The staff and doctors rushed out to help Dan out of the car, placed him on a gurney, and rolled him into the ER. They undressed him and removed his helmet. With every question the doctor asked, Dan had one of his own. He felt as if it was deja vu, the hospital, the nurses rushing about, being rolled into the examining rooms, x-rays, CT scan, all over again. He felt as if he was reliving the aftermath of his skiing accident once again. In between his muddled thoughts, there was one that came to the forefront of his mind. Thank you, God, for giving me another chance at life. The other thing that seemed strange to Dan was that his shoulder, the one he had smashed when he landed on the rock, at the end of his rapid descent and subsequent fall against the rock in the Paconos, didn't hurt anymore. Dan had gone to a few orthopaedic surgeons and they all had given him the same answer, we need to operate. Yet he had been sceptical to allow anyone to go there and do anything since he had always been very active with weight lifting and parallel bars. He was afraid that once he was operated, he would not be able to work out the way he always did. And on that day when he fell off his bike, he also hit his shoulder hard upon landing on the dirt-packed track, and now for some strange reason the blow to his shoulder cured the pain. Being first diagnosed with a concussion, as soon as Dan was brought into the hospital room he was to occupy for a few days, Malou, Gabby and Daniel came in. Daniel had driven the trailer back to their home in Davie and had alerted his mother and sister of his father's misadventure. Sweetheart, Malou said softly as she came to stand beside his bed. Will you ever learn not to take such risks? It's pure foolishness on your part and you know it. Dan had to smile at her scolding, but he had to ask, Was this all a dream? What are you talking about? Did you dream of something? Dan shook his head and decided to leave all these questions until he would go home. However, he couldn't get an answer. He was wearing his dreamcatcher and so were his boys, his daughter and Malou. Obviously, he had to conclude none of what had happened had been a dream except for the fact that he was back in Davie with his family. When the family left his bedside that night, Dan fell into unconsciousness. One night, as Dan was looking around his desk for some paperwork or other, his hand fell on an old book. He grabbed it, looked at the strange-looking lock on the side of it and then suddenly remembered Chippewa giving that very same book to Daniel to carry when his family were about to leave him behind in Key West. He sat down in the chair by his desk and wondered where the key would be. He wanted to open it to see if it contained the same writings, the same suggestions. He rummaged through his desk drawers, then got up and went to the bookcase. He looked at the rows of books for the longest time and shook his head. He couldn't remember where he had put the key. Is that what you're looking for? Salangi's voice whispered from beside him. Stunned beyond words, Dan spun on his heels and stared at the little key in the palm of the angel's hand. Take it, it's yours, she said. Dan hesitated and then smiled. He was dying to ask why he was here in his home and why God didn't let him atone for his transgressions. Why am I back? he asked hesitantly. I wanted... What you wanted, Dan, was and is not important, Salangi told him. Redeeming oneself comes with time and abidance to God's precepts. Your willingness to sacrifice yourself so that your son should live was enough at the time to enable you to come back and watch over your family. Nevertheless, you have a long road to go before atonement can be reached. Dan continued staring but finally took the key from Salangi's open palm. As he was looking at it, the angel disappeared from sight. Dan called after her quietly at first and then screamed her name to the empty room. Once again, he was alone, his mind whirling with questions. Upon hearing his insistent shouts, Malou came rushing into the den and looked around her. There was no one there. She walked to the desk and looked at the book atop the plotter. She caressed its cover and wondered if she really heard her husband's voice. Then her hand touched something. She picked it up and stared. She was holding Dan's wedding band in her hand. I love you, honey, she murmured as she looked up to the ceiling and plopped down in the chair. 
and started sobbing quietly. <laughs>